All right. Good morning, everyone. Uh, welcome to another class. Uh, let's just begin this time with a word of prayer. Uh, can one of us please lead us in prayer? Uh, Mangi, can you lead us in prayer, please? Yes, Pastor. Go ahead. Thank you. Holy Father, we we come to you this morning and we thank you, Lord, for this opportunity, Lord, to learn about the history of your church and revival and what you've done before. And we pray Jesus that as we learn through this, through the experience of what our forefathers went through and they have done, we pray, Father, that you will inspire our hearts, Lord, and so that we will be equipped and we'll be bold to go and do the same. Open our heart and open our mind. In Jesus' name, Father, I pray. Amen. 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 Thank you, Manki. All right. Uh, so let's just pick up from what we did yesterday. Uh, yesterday, we looked at reformers and reformation. We looked at a few of their characteristics, uh, what reformers, uh, you know, the characteristics that they carried. Uh, you know, they had revelation of the word of God. They had a uh, in-depth re relationship with the word, with God. And uh, they had the strength to stand alone. They were willing to lay down their life for the truth. And uh, they were willing to use all the tools possible uh, to share the message of the gospel. And we also looked at chapter five very briefly. And we looked at the Moravian revival. Uh, and what, what we want to do is in this chapter, we will look at a few revivals, uh, not in depth, right? We're just going to do like an overview of the revival. And then the main focus will be the reflection or the takeaways from that revival. I know we did all of these, most of the revivals earlier on. But we didn't really you know have any takeaway or any reflection from that so we thought okay let's do the revival and then a few pointers takeaways practical thoughts that we can apply uh, to, in our lives so yesterday we looked at the moravian revival and how uh, god used this man named count zinzendorf a young man a rich man uh, in germany and you know there was persecution from the uh, Catholic Church, and this whole group of people came to uh, Zinzendorf's farmhouse or estate, and they used to stay there. But there was division among them, uh, and but uh, Zinzendorf told them, and he exhorted them, uh, you know, we are to be in unity, we are to be in oneness, and and so uh, at a young age, he he was able to preach the gospel, and they all. All of them uh, repented of their sins and were willing to change their ways. And we see that uh, the, this revival, the Moravian revival, started off through prayer. Few people in the mornings, few people in the evenings got together. Uh, you know, uh, different ministries came together to spend time in prayer. And over the hundred odd years, uh, we see that there were more than a hundred thousand people who came to Christ many missionaries were sent out from the moravian revival and through this uh, the uh, you know the moravian missionaries were sent to uh, amsterdam uh, uh, sri lanka south africa turkey all across the world what started off as a small group of people in hiding because of the catholic church turned into a, a, a place where revival was birthed Right. And, uh, you know, there were there was continuous prayer happening in uh, Zizendorf's estate. Leaders were raised up, missionaries were raised up. And later on, many of the missionaries like William Carey, George Whitfield, John Wesley, they were all directly impacted and influenced by the Moravian revival. Uh, so we looked at a reflection of how unity is very important when we want a revival 
when we want an outpouring of God, we also briefly looked at the book of Acts, where 120 people were just in the upper room in unity. Right? Uh, Paul also exhorts the church in, uh, in Corinthians uh, to the Corinth church, and he says, uh, are you not divided? You have all these gifts. You have the gifts of the Spirit. You are a, uh, you know, a, a spiritual church, yet you are divided. And where there's division, the move of the Holy Spirit will be dampened. Right? So that's what we saw. Uh, we also saw that this prayer movement of revival and world missions went on for 100 years, the Moravian revival. So it was not something that just happened. And then, okay, two years later, it just died off. No, uh, there was fruit. There was long lasting fruit, right? So what started, it didn't just end in a year or two years, but over the period of 100 years, there was fruit. Churches uh, saw uh, a, a growth uh, in attendance. They saw many people coming to Christ. So now we'll pick up from here. Let's look at the Second Great Awakening. We looked at it previously. We saw uh, that the Second Great Awakening was more in North America. Spiritual conditions was bad. Moral conditions were bad in America. Attendance in churches was bleak. Uh, the Methodist, the Lutheran, the Presbyterian, name it, the Anglican churches, all the churches were dry and were not seeing any uh, move of God. College campuses that previously saw revivals now are seeing a dry time. There were no Christians in the college campuses to start any prayers. Um, it is said that about uh, in the whole of the church, the, sorry, the whole of Harvard University had only about one or two Christians. Right? Uh, and so they couldn't really do much. So that was the condition of North America. But uh, there was this young pastor named Isaac Bacchus who, who, who saw all of this, uh, the spiritual conditions of North America, and he decided, let us all call for prayer. Right? So he called uh, prayer for, from all the denominations. He said, okay, let's all of us come together and seek God for our uh, nation of America. Uh, so they all joined together. 23 ministers got together, right? And they began to pray. Uh, and when they saw this, Christians from other places, other, uh, you know, prayer leaders or ministry leaders in the church said, okay, the pastors are doing this. So let us also join together and you know pray for our nation and so that's what happened small pockets of groups uh began to pray in different places it was in the morning afternoon evening they had times of you know uh, uh distributed prayer time something like what we call as chain prayers that uh, we have, we are doing now uh but prayers were a constant thing and then what happened we know what happened during that time the revival began to pour out a re revival began to start through uh, Kentucky, where something that was as small as 25 people in Kentucky in a small church uh, called Red River Church, the Spirit of God just moved uh, in this place. I'm not going to name the preachers because we may get confused, but I'm just trying to bring the gist of the story. 25 people got together, uh, prayed. They spent many a days uh, crying in their tears, praying. And then uh, God sent Methodist preachers, God sent Anglican preachers. And so it was more of, let, it was not like, okay, uh, my church should grow. It was not like my denomination is better than yours. Or it was not like, you know, uh, 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 we, are, we know all everything, or we are right and you are wrong. All of those barriers were broken off. They had one common need, one common prayer at that time. And that was God, pour out your revival in the church. Right? Uh, 
because the conditions were bad spiritual conditions moral conditions it is said that during that time uh, if you were a christian uh, before the revival if you were a christian uh, people would mock at you it was so bad in america uh, that you know they they regarded the christians as people who have you know lazy i didn't didn't want anything to do didn't want to you know they had put uh, names on these christians but later on as these people began to cry out and pray they wept they fell on the floor they began to pray under conviction uh weeping crying and seeking god uh suddenly there was a great move of the holy spirit and there were great manifestations it is said that in kentucky alone about 25000 people uh accepted the lord with unusual signs and wonders happening about 3000 people were slain and fallen on the ground slain in the spirit just falling confessing their sins weeping uh and and asking god to change our situation change uh, you know uh, their lives the lives of their families the lives of their children and 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 change the lives of the people around in the nation the we see that during this revival the uh, not uh, the, the second awakening uh, what happened was the church the Methodist the, the Baptist churches alone saw hundred thousand members uh, being added and the Methodist churches saw about 40,000 members being added every denomination saw the fruit of revival right? and then of course just like what we see in all other revivals the revival spread into different parts of the country right college campuses began to see revival right God used people in college campuses uh, young men and women of God began to take up the stand Yale University Oxford uh, uh, they began to see revivals within the college campuses right now what are some of the reflections that we can take from this uh, second great awakening first one one of the most important precursors of revival was united consistent widespread engagement of prayer united consistent and widespread uh, engagement of prayer we will see the same point in almost every revival right that only through prayer is when we will see revival right uh, so very important precursor is united consistent prayer together with one heart with one mind i believe that if we as believers and ministers of god as a church right if we come to this mindset of being you know kingdom builders uh, a mindset of you know hey i am not building my kingdom i'm not building my church yes god has given us those uh, facets where we need to work towards our church and each church has its own essence but when we see the bigger picture that we are building God's kingdom I believe that as as the body of Christ we can rise up we can stand up we will be able to do something for our nation I remember this one time we went to uh, it was, I think it was Varanasi in uh, North India. And those of you who uh, don't know about Varanasi, Varanasi is like the hub of India, which has, uh, it's a religious center. The river Ganges flow there. And so uh, you have something called as a Kumbh Mela where hundreds and thousands of, uh, uh, you know, uh, people who, devotees come there and it's a place where Hindus have most of their, uh, you know, forms of worship and uh, everything is done in that center. So Varanasi is a center for, uh, you know, it's a religious site for the Hindus. And I think it was 2012, I could be wrong, the year, but 2011, 2012, uh, 
you know, we went as a small team uh, to Varanasi and uh, when we went there, we, you know, we knew a few pastors there also. So we said, uh, I remember we, we started off with, you know, uh, a prayer time. I said, Let's meet in a house just to pray. Right. So there were a few of us from uh, Bangalore who would go up to Varanasi and we would spend time in prayer with a few pastors, with a few believers, just praying. Right? Nobody knew about it. We would just go finish praying, you know, maybe three days, and then come back. So this went on for about a year or two years. And what we saw was all of them had one mind. Right? Uh, there was no thought of, okay, you know, uh, uh, oh, these guys are coming from the city, or we can, you know, uh, I request them for this and that, uh, you know, or we can, you know, ask them for a church hall. We can ask them. For, there was, there was no other thoughts. There, there was only one intention, and that was to pray. About a year and a half later, what started as about with five, six of us, went on to become a bigger group, a bigger group. Uh, at, at a point, we were about 100 people just joining together. And then that gave us an opportunity uh, to start, you know, conferences. So we started doing conferences in Varanasi. And through those conferences, many people came uh, and were blessed during those conferences. Many people said they wanted to study. And so uh, they said, we don't have any colleges here, uh, any good Bible-believing colleges. Then, uh, you know, uh, we pastor came up with this decision to have the short-term Bible college uh, in Varanasi, where three months we would go and teach people on the Word of God. And it's so wonderful that what started as something small, just going and pray, uh, is able to even touch and impact lives now. Uh, and so prayer is very important. You know, when we look at uh, ministries now and you know uh, uh, there's this young man in church and he was, he was talking to me he said uh, oh pastor I want to become a, a apostle I said yeah that's great God has given you that calling and so I told him so what do you do uh, what is what is your lifestyle what do you do in the morning uh, how long do you spend time in the word and how long do you spend time in prayer so he said yeah I spend uh, 10 minutes in the word and 10 minutes uh, praying uh, so I said, okay, so what is the call that you want to do? He said, I want to be an apostle. I want to go to these different nations and preach the gospel. So I remember telling him, this happened a couple of years back. I remember telling him, uh, if you want to see fruit, there needs to be sacrifice. So I remember telling him, you need to get into the word. You need to start praying even more. And only, and only then will God open doors and God use you and you can be fruitful in the ministry. We cannot do it out of our natural abilities. Yes, God uses our natural abilities. Yes, we have to speak well. We have to uh, you know, use the wisdom of God. All of that is there. But the precursor for God to use us in an outpouring is prayer. You cannot undo prayer and do everything else. Right? Uh, I love what Jesus says. You shall be known not by our preaching, teaching, not by uh, how big our church is, how big our ministry is. We shall be known by our fruit. Right? So here, we one of the important points we take is prayer. And we will see this continuing in every revival. Second thing, there were unusual manifestations. Right? Example, there was loud laughter, there was shouting, there was uh, people were running in conviction. They, they said that they felt that the enemy was just trying to devour them during the prayer time. So they said that, you know, they uh, began to run uh, within the auditorium and outside and all of it. People began to scream and shout. Uh, it is also, you know, pe people say that in the North American, the second uh, awakening they felt that when the preachers were preaching they felt that hell was opening and you know people were getting into that uh, you know 
these are just sayings right so they felt it that way so uh, and they felt the move of god they felt peace they felt joy there was laughter there was happiness so it was a combination of manifestations now did these manifestations did create controversies like many people said hey what are they doing uh, screaming and shouting are they drunk uh, you know running and uh, it is they also went and clung onto trees uh, you know maybe in the fear or reverence of God we don't know what the Holy Spirit was doing at that time uh, there were many controversies right uh, uh, many especially the Presbyterian the Baptist the Methodist they were all you know if you study about them they were all very you know uh, uh, methodical very uh, you know uh, practical they would preach the you know they would have songs preach the word and then do an altar call very you know simple but uh, not everyone uh, you know uh, accepted these unusual manifestations but later on uh, the these people the ministers began to see the fruit of the revival uh, and they saw that people were repenting they were changed lives uh, people were added into the church so they all together the presbyterian the baptist the methodist all of them together pressed in for the revival so that was wonderful right even though they didn't agree with something they saw the fruit and they pressed in for more of god right maybe even things that are happening now we may not agree with a few things right we may not agree with a few things but see the fruit if there is fruit, long lasting fruit, lives being touched, people brought to Christ, let's press in. Let's pray for them. Let's, let's not uh, you know, destroy what God is building. And they were able to do that. These unusual manifestations did cause a controversy, but they pressed in because they saw the fruit. Third thing we see here is transformation of communities. Almost every revival, the revival did not stay in that place, right? It began to go to different communities. And so the working plus people, the college campuses, uh, you know, in different homes, all of them began to sense that, you know, that conviction of the Holy Spirit. There was this high desire of holiness, right? Normally, it wouldn't be around. Right? That that feeling of okay, I'm on, I'm under conviction. Uh, I'm sure we all have gone through that. The Holy Spirit convicts us. We say, hey, oh, I should not have done this. Or the Holy Spirit is convicting me, and we just repent. Uh, so it was almost constant. Everyone were feeling that sense of you know uh, they are sinful. And so what happened? People, criminals, people who were uh, living sinful lives, you know, changed their lives. They gave their lives to Christ. College campuses which had, uh, which were dry, which had no Christians, and they were living a debauched life. Even here, the college campuses began to see revivals, prayer movements. Uh, we saw that during the North American, the Second Awakening, uh, many places, many colleges, their classes were stopped. Why? Because prayer is happening in the auditorium. Nobody wants to come up, stop the prayer. And so what started with 10 people became 1,000, 2,000, 5,000, 10,000. Finally, the principal of uh, the college itself said, remember Bethel College, we studied that, not Bethel at Reading, but the one in Kansas, where the principal himself said, okay, we are going to leave the auditorium open. You want to pray, you all keep praying. Uh, and classes, if you want to attend, you can attend classes. So it was... They just could not stop the move of God. A transformation was happening in different parts of the community. Right? Uh, so these three points are, is something that we can take. Prayer, even through unusual manifestations, they pressed on. And three, there was transformation of communities. Next one, let's look at the layman's prayer revival. Now, we did this, and this happened in New York. God used laymen to start this revival. 
And this revival is known as one of the most widespread revival in American history, right? Uh, uh, this, this time was a time when businesses began to collapse. Uh, the banking system in the United States collapsed. People lost their jobs. 30,000 odd people were unemployed. Uh, everything was going wrong in America, right? What boasted of a high economy and great uh, infrastructure, all of a sudden, the early 1800s saw a downfall uh, in America, right? And uh, businesses began to collapse. Small businesses just broke down. People were, uh, you know, if you think of it, it was like a mini pandemic. Only thing, it was not sickness, but it was a pandemic of uh, of failures during that time. Uh, but the flip side of the coin, God raised up a few leaders and ministers. Charles Finney, Walter, and uh, uh, Phoebe Palmer, a, a couple, uh, had a deep hunger for God, and they began to pray for revival. Now picture this. One side, you got people who are without the job. The economy is down. The banking sector has collapsed. Probably just sitting at home wondering what they should do. Family, children to feed, a bleak future. And on the other side, you got God raising up these leaders, uh, sparking uh, a revival in their hearts. And then they call for prayer. Now, it's so wonderful, right? Because usually when we have a need, right, we will come for prayer, right? Uh, if everything's going fine, we will, not, we will not pray. We will not spend additional time in prayer. Here there was a need. And here these young men, a uh, small group of people said, let's meet for prayer. And so what happened was it about, uh, you know, uh, Jeremiah Lanfire, a newly appointed city uh, missionary in New York City, he had one idea. He said, okay, many of us don't have a job, but many of them are also working. So let us have afternoon prayer because usually in the afternoons, what they would do is they would work uh, and then afternoons they would have their lunch and they would rest. They would come back in the evenings to work and they would go on till uh, late night. And so he said, let's start noonday prayer meetings. Right? So what he did was he went, uh, Jeremiah went on the streets and he gave out some pamphlets to people calling for midday prayer in New York City. Uh, so the, the first day, six people attended the prayer, right? Six people. The second week saw 20 people. The third week saw 40 people. The fourth week saw 100 people. And suddenly, the whole auditorium was packed. They had about 3,000 people coming in the afternoon to pray. Now picture this. Six people turned into 20 people. 20 to 40, 40 to 100, 100 to about 3,000 people. All happened in one year, right? And what are they coming for? It's not a worship evening concert. It's not a, a time of, you know, uh, just preaching. No, it is a time of prayer, a time where they would eat and rest in the afternoon. 3,000 odd people packed in an auditorium. So what happened? Everyone are wondering, hey, what's happening here? 3,000 odd people are coming and they're praying, they're weeping, they're mourning, they're crying, they're crying out to God, asking God for restoration, asking God for revival, asking God to restore their nation. Uh, the city of New York is uh, 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 in calamities. And then people from other places said, hey, they are praying. 12 o'clock to 1 o'clock. We need to do the same. So other cities joined in, neighboring cities. Uh, all of them said, okay, we'll also do 12 to 1. And all of a sudden, the entire nation of America was having a 12 p.m. to 1 p.m. prayer with about 800,000 people joining together in prayer. Now, we must remember this. The population was 
you know little uh, over you know 100 uh, maybe a million 1 million to 1.5 million 800,000 people joining together all across America for a one hour of prayer what happens the newspapers news reporters came they say hey what's happening here revival they're praying for revival so it became the newspaper headlines you know the progress for of the revival these are people all across our nation who are praying for revival and great testimonies were raised ten thousands of people were converted each week imagine that ten thousand people each week so well, what are these people doing? They are praying. They are, uh, you know, they're coming in, in front. They're getting convicted. They are accepting Christ. Ten thousand people each week, and then they would go back to their churches. Now, all of a sudden, the Methodist, the Presbyterian, the Anglican, the whatever denomination was there, what may have had twenty, thirty people, or hundred people gathering, started seeing three thousand, four thousand people. Now, I, I, if we picture this, imagine some of the pastors there saying, what is happening? Why are so many people coming to church? Maybe they didn't do anything, right? They were just in church. They didn't really you know, go out on outreach. They're wondering what's happening. It was because of this prayer meetings. God used a layman, Jeremiah Landfire, put it in his heart for one, you know, one hour of prayer in the afternoon. Right? six people he started with uh and it just grew and this this revival has amazing testimonies of god's glorious presence uh it is said that uh, uh people day and night would stay in those church locations they wouldn't go back home right people would close shops why because they're in the church uh what uh, people who made fun of christians and mocked them now were probably converted or also had nothing to say because the move of God was greater than what was happening around them. Over 1 million people estimated were converted uh, uh, and about another 1 million uh, members were revived. So about 2 million people added into the citywide church in the nation of America. It went on. They fueled this revival with prayer. Uh, they continued 12 to 1, 12 to 1, praying for revival. 500,000, sorry, 50,000 conversions happened each week. And this revival, what started in New York, went into Wales, went into Scotland, Ireland, Britain, Germany, Netherlands, West Indies, South Africa, India, Indonesia, and other parts of the world. How did it start off? One man. Jeremiah Landfire, no credentials. He was not, uh, uh, you know, a great man, a known man. Just a call for prayer from 12 to 1 p.m. And God used him so powerfully. 100,000, 500,000 odd people, million, two million people revived, brought into the church. What an amazing work. Now let's look at a reflection, what we can learn from this outpouring, from this revival. There was earnest prayer. Once again, prayer was the fuel. For several years, prayer went on. Uh, you know, uh, these young men and women probably joined together. There was a sacrifice, right? There was a sacrifice. If God has, is calling us, we need to understand that we have to sacrifice. Uh, a lot of them look at ministry as, okay, hey, we can just, you know, relax. No, it's the other way around. It's a call to sacrifice. It is spending time. It is it is to uh, give ourselves fully to the Lord. Say, God, I'm willing to sacrifice uh, things, I'm willing to sacrifice the pleasures of this world. Yes, God has blessed us. God wants us to enjoy, you know, to enjoy the things of this world, but our heart is not set on that, right? Uh, God blesses us. That's good, right? Uh, but our hearts and our minds are, should not be set on worldly things, right? We use them, 
right? Uh, nothing wrong in going for a holiday, nothing wrong in buying a car, nothing wrong in buying a house. We need all of that. Uh, but our heart and mind is not, you know, fully set on that. Our heart is fixed on Jesus. Prayer became the precursor again, an important key to prepare the way for ministry. Uh, so let's look at a few reflections. A spark that lit the blaze. This small idea. I'm sure Jeremiah or Lanfire would have thought, okay, maybe we'll start prayer. Maybe a hundred people will come and then a thousand people. And then slowly the church will you know, increase. Do you think he would have thought, hey, I'm going to start this prayer. And then through this prayer, there'll be a great revival. And then there will be two million people uh, you know, revived and added into the church. I'm sure he would have never thought of that. He said, hey, let's just start a prayer, you know. I'll just get together, pray, and ask God to restore us. Something was a spark. That spark was all that God needed. Right? And God used Jeremiah Landfire, a simple man. And the spark, we know that there was a blaze of revival. Two, we see here that God just used laymen. There was no famous preachers. There were no great orators regular men and women of God. Right? Probably they didn't know everything in the Bible. They probably didn't know much of the teachings. But all they knew is we can pray. We can pray and ask God. Here's the important thing. Sometimes we may look at us as inferior. We look at ourselves, hey, what can God do through me? No, I don't know how to speak or oh, I'm too shy or I'm just at home most of the time. No, God uses just the lay people. It's not only the pastors or the prophets, the evangelists. God bless all of them. But God uses lay people to fulfill his work. Right? So if God is putting a spark in your heart, for example, start an evening prayer in your house or start just a, a time of worship, uh, go ahead. Prayerfully consider and start. What started with six people can grow into many, many people and touch many lives. Right? Uh, I just want to share this. You know, when we came to Mangalore, we were about 10, 8 to 10 people. And you know, I thought to myself, hey, we can build this church, no problem. It's in the city, you know, uh, you can just go out on a few outreaches and then do uh, do some events, worship evenings, school of ministry, do some events. People will come. And so when I came here, it was 2018. Uh, 2018 to 2019, I had you know written down, OK, in one year, we should be at least about uh, you know uh, 70 to 80 people. Uh, because a lot of the, uh, you know, in this city, most of, most of them go for uh, Kannada services and they have a their Konkani language here, the regular, the local language. So most of them go there. So English congregations is lesser than compared to the um, you know local languages here. So I said, okay, 80 to 90. And I had written down, and put a whole plan. Uh, I prayed about this and all of that. 2018 July is when we came here. 2019 July, I looked at the church. We were... 25 odd people. I said, one year, there was 15 people added into the church. And I went back and I, 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 I remember going back to God and I said, what is happening? And the Lord very clearly told me, you're depending on your abilities. Right? Very clearly, it was very clear. You're depending on your abilities, your talents, your gifts. You know, sometimes we think that we can do it on our own, right? You know, I can lead the worship and then I can preach and I don't need anybody. Right? I don't have to depend on anyone. So the Lord very clearly ministered to me and he said, you're doing this on your own. You seek me, you pray, and I will bring people into the church. So I began to pray. I said, let's keep aside events. And I called the church and I said, some of the leaders, I said, let's pray. Let's have times of fasting and prayer. Let's have times of... Uh, extended times of prayer. And we did that. Wednesdays we would pray, Fridays we would pray, uh, uh, spend extended, we'd start our services with prayer. 
and slowly 2019 july till the you know 2020 march was the uh, was the pandemic started but in that in that just that couple of months so that's july to uh, january or february 2020 uh, until the pandemic started all of a sudden we became about 70 to 75 people just a few months right and very less outreach and of course we, we went out and did you know outreaches for events and all but we focused more on prayer and so i realized i that you know god if god wants to do something in our midst we need to be praying people even in our ministries only if we pray will we see the fruit god used these laymen to start a revival newspapers became a tool and people newspapers reporters started to write and say there's revival happening in new york there's revival spreading all across the world people would reopen the newspapers the first thing they would see christians are having a revival thousands are coming to god more people were inspired to come to christ there was a global impact from this layman's revival right uh which affected the entire world. So that's powerful. That's powerful. It's a powerful uh, uh, revival that lasted for many years. Just started with a prayer, right? Uh, okay, we have a few more minutes. So let's go to the next one. Any questions, any thoughts, anybody would like to share something? I know I've been talking. Uh, any thoughts, any questions? Are you tra is, is it okay? Is it too much? Are you tracking along? Okay, should we continue? Okay, all right. Okay, let's quickly look at the Welsh revival. Now, uh, many of us may have heard of Evan Roberts. Uh, Evan Roberts was in Wales. Again, very similar to North America. They were in a bad state spiritually. Churches were empty. Uh, Christians lost their influence. Early 1900s saw uh, uh, you know, increase in business again. Things started to recover after the revivals uh, of uh, uh, the Second Great Awakening. But after things started to recover again, somewhere uh, uh, 30 or 40 years later, when as things recovered, the churches started to come down. Moral conditions started to come down. There was an increase in prayer across Wales. More churches came together and said, okay, it's happened in the past. God can do it now. We need to get together and pray. So prayer meetings were held. This young man named Evan Roberts, God used him powerfully. He was a son of a coal miner, a Calvinistic Methodist from a small boy, very fervent for the Lord. He always prayed. He spent time in the word. He always, you know, uh, was a very good young man uh, attended church regularly he would spend time in the nights memorizing scriptures um, uh, and after the age of 23 he worked in the coal mines with his father and uh, evan roberts was uh, would spend many hours praying uh, he would pray personally he would pray uh, have uh, group prayer meetings and one of the things he would always pray was holy spirit control me right um he later on spent many hours uh, praying for revival. Now he's just a young man, early 20s, right? And uh, praying for revival. Now, uh, a couple of years later, he went to work with his uncle, who was a blacksmith. Uh, and then at the age of 26, he decided to join a Bible school and go for ministry. So when he joined Bible school, he felt the Lord telling him, uh, to spend more time in prayer. So he decided he will spend seven hours a day with God, praying and reading the word. Seven hours a day, right? So there was this young preacher named Seth Joshua, Presbyterian preacher, evangelist, who came to the city uh, at that time. And Seth Joshua was doing a conference. And so they canceled the classes. The Bible college students could go for the conference. And in that conference, Seth Joshua began to preach. And he ended by saying, 
uh, oh God, bend us, right? Uh, and he did an altar call. Evan Roberts went in front. He prayed with great agony and he said, God, bend us, right? This is what started a passion for souls in uh, Evan Roberts' heart. He started praying for 100,000 souls. He said, God, let 100,000 souls be saved and converted and brought to you. And he believed that God would do that in his life, right? So uh, he went back to his Bible college. He started to continue his studies, but somewhere, you know, he could not concentrate on his studies. So he went to his principal and he said, I want to go back to my city and uh, uh, preach to the people there, to the young people. So the principal said, okay, you can go for a couple of weeks. Uh, so he went, he told his pastor, I want to preach uh, to these young people. And uh, uh, he suggested some prayer meetings on Mondays. The pastor said, okay, uh, not yet. You still need to finish your Bible college and uh, but pastor gave him an opportunity. Uh, so after a service, a pastor said, if you stay back, Evan Roberts is going to just share with us and spend some time in prayer. Uh, so 17 people stayed back. Right Now, that time it was a great thing because there were hardly 100, 100 odd people in the church. So 17 people stayed back. And then he gave a simple message uh, and he directed them to the salvation, to how uh, we can find forgiveness of sins and all 17 people responded to the to evan roberts the pastor was happy the pastor said okay evan you can continue the next day so day after day he would have these prayer meetings it went on the numbers started increasing people started coming right uh, the main roads where the church was situated was packed all of a sudden the churches were packed Right, so the prayers went on from night to four in the morning, four a.m. Right, on Sunday, the church was filled. Right, uh, the first five weeks of the revival saw about twenty thousand to thirty thousand people being saved. What was probably about hundreds of people, the first week saw twenty thousand to thirty thousand people being saved. Right, then. Uh, the second week saw second or third week saw seventy thousand being saved. Then by the end of the year, in just one year, they saw eighty five thousand people coming to Christ. Right, Evan Roberts started traveling because people started calling him, and he would go out and preach in many many places. Uh, he engaged in strong preaching, teaching of the Word of God, focusing on repentance, prayer and intercession so what again here started with 17 people a desire in his heart right to do something for god uh when i told the pastor can i do this uh and what started with 17 people in about one and a half years turned out to be eighty-five thousand people coming to christ the social impact was astounding in the welsh revival the welsh revival saw some of the greatest uh you know changes in uh society judges were given white gloves because there was no cases there was no there were no murderers there were no robbers there were no rapists the thefts had stopped drunkenness had gone down taverns were closed pubs were closed police were unemployed so the police chief actually told the police okay since you are unemployed you have to do some kind of work go and join the singing team in the church so the whole police would go and uh, uh evan roberts would have these meetings so the police would be the worship team they would sing because uh, they don't have any other work and they had to give in some kind of hours and the coal mines also were affected because the miners were uh, sitting in the church crying and weeping. They didn't want to leave the church. Uh, uh, people stopped using bad language. Uh, it is said that, you know, the, during those times, the, the Welsh people would, uh, you know, curse the horse uh, which carries the mine, uh, the coal. Uh, and so they, they, they would curse the horse, but the horse, uh, and only then the horse would do its work. But after the revival, they stopped cursing. So the horse didn't understand that new language. They were very polite. And so that became a little bit of a challenge. But moral standards were affected. Uh, illegitimate births were brought down. Revival spread across Germany, 
North America, Australia, Africa, India. And later on, these Welsh missionaries came to Meghalaya and, uh, uh, you know, revival broke out in the Kasi Hills where we briefly did that as well. Uh, quickly, I'll just come to a close here. Evan Roberts came under rigorous pressure for his schedule. He suffered physically and emotionally. He had like a breakdown, a collapse. And because of that, you know, he could not go out on preaching. He dedicated his time just for prayer and writing. And many of them, uh, many of the other leaders continued the work, but he could not go out. And uh, you know, about 20 odd years later, a reporter asked Evan Roberts, do you think we can see revival as what we saw when you were young and when you did the ministry? Uh, he answered, yes, but who will pay the price? Yes, we can see the revival, but who will pay the price for it? A price has to be paid. Well, some of the reflections that we can see in this is uh, there was complete surrender. Evan Roberts was willing to surrender to an uncommon vessel, uh, a young man with no great claim, but God used him. There was the Holy Spirit proof fruit, sorry, uh, the results saw the society uh, impacted and it was a pure work of God. It was not manufactured by any person. And then later on, here's the important part, the fruit was consolidated, which means it was made strong. It, it was not a emotional feeling, oh, okay, I accept Christ. And then two years later, they just go away. They saw 75% of the attendance still in church, even after five years. So the fruit was consolidated. Just the last point. The important thing that we can learn from Evan Roberts is that we need to work as a team. Evan Roberts was doing everything on his own, and that's why it caused a physical and mental breakdown. Uh, we need to understand that we need rest. Uh, we need to refresh ourselves. We need to pace ourselves in the ministry or in the midst of an outpouring or a revival. And also to form a team, which is so important, that can share the burdens of the ministry. So we'll stop here. Sorry, it took a few additional minutes. Uh, we'll pick up from next week uh, and we will continue to study on this take up reflections and personal learnings from these revivals. Right, let's just quickly close in prayer. Father, we want to thank you for this beautiful day, Lord. We thank you for what you've done in the church. And Lord, we stand on your word that you will continue to build your church and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. Lord, we pray that you spark this revival in each of our hearts. Uh, spark it in us, Lord, and use us for your glory, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. God bless you all. Have a wonderful day ahead. Have a wonderful week. I'll see you next Monday. God bless.